Coming up on DTNS, Uber's transparency report, a smart robot for space people, and why companies have so many security problems. This is the Daily Tech News for Friday, December 6, 2019 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. Drawing the top tech stories from Cleveland, Ohio, I'm Len Peralta. Hi, the show's producer, Roger Chang. And uh, joining us today, very happy to have David Spark, producer of the CISO series at CISOseries.com, back on the show. I mean, if we're going to do that, let's just do it right here and give him some real applause. How's it going, David? Thank you very much. It's great to be back on the show again. We've known each other for decades, Tom, I realize. Literally decades now. Decades, yeah. yes. That's amazing. It's a because uh, like, we had that, uh, what was it, a year or two years ago, there was a 20-year anniversary up here of uh, ZDTV days. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, hmm. it's bizarre to me. We I mean, were uh, just entertaining David with our ridiculous conversations on Good Day Internet about <laughs> sandwiches and lemurs. Uh, you get that wider conversation by becoming a patron at patreon.com slash DTNS. Let's start with a few tech things you should know. Qualcomm announced the Snapdragon XR2 augmented reality platform with a dedicated AI engine and 5G capability. The XR2 supports 8K, 360-degree video playback and can output to 3K by 3K per eye displays running at 90 frames per second. Its vision processor supports up to seven tracking cameras. Five OEMs are developing headsets on the platform already. Pokemon Go creator Niantic will work with Qualcomm to create reference hardware and software and cloud components for XR2 powered AR glasses with support for Niantic's real world platform. And uh, Qualcomm isn't done announcing things in Hawaii until they announce their two new Windows on ARM socks, systems on chips, Snapdragon 8C and 7C. The 8C succeeds the Snapdragon 850. Qualcomm says it'll have 30% better performance. And the 7C is meant for entry-level laptops. Uh, it does not have 5G support, although the 8C does. Qualcomm says the 7C will offer 25% better system performance and twice the battery life of competing x86-based platforms at the same price point. So a little shot across the bow at Intel there. U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders announced a plan to subsidize local publicly owned broadband networks, reinstate open internet guidelines, and classify broadband internet service as a public utility. Sanders also wants to, quote, unwind anti-competitive vertical conglomerates and stop internet service providers from also providing content. So Elizabeth Warren wants to break up Facebook, Google, and Amazon. Bernie Sanders wants to break up AT&T, Comcast, and, and Charter. Uh, maybe they'll be on the same ticket and just break everybody up. Who knows? A delegation of Swiss companies met in Mauritius to encourage collaboration on blockchain-based ventures there. Mauritius is an island nation in the Indian Ocean just to the east of Madagascar, off the coast of Africa. The founder and CEO of Crypto Valley Venture Capital presented three seminars on creating a blockchain technology ecosystem in Mauritius. Crypto Valley Venture Capital is considering pursuing a blockchain hub for the African continent based on the island of Mauritius. All right, let's talk a little more about Samsung rumors. We got all these Apple rumors. Let's talk some Samsung rumors. Let's do it. Sources tell Bloomberg that Samsung's upcoming Galaxy S11 device will feature a 108 megapixel sensor that it announced back in August as one of four in its rear camera to come. The other cameras will include a 5X optical zoom lens and an ultra wide angle, as well as a time of flight depth sensing camera. The high resolution sensor and telephoto camera will also reportedly be included on a Galaxy fold clamshell device. Both hmm. devices are expected to be announced in February. Xiaomi is also using the 108 megapixel Samsung sensor in the Xiaomi CC Pro and Sam Mobile says that the Galaxy S11 will also have a 5,000 milliamp battery. So a big one. I mean, we shouldn't have been surprised to hear that Samsung would use the big sensor that Samsung Imaging made uh, when they announced it in August. I assume that was going to be going in, but people are are going nuts about this story today for some reason. David, do you have any idea why people would get so excited? Not just well, about 108 megapixels, about but also the size megapixels? of the sensor. It's, let me I, excuse my ignorance. What was the previous megapixel size that we're at? What are we at currently? I don't even know. It doesn't. Phone. It's not even so much the number of megapixels as the size of the sensor. It's like one and a half inches large. So oh, yeah, the, yeah. the thing that people are so excited about is this gets close to a mirrorless camera in a phone. Right. Well, we have, by the way, we've been shooting a lot of great video on phones anyways for quite some time. And uh, I mean, yeah, I, a lot of people are seeing 
honestly, with the video quality with phones so good, really the only thing that fails is the quality sound and the quality lighting. I mean, there was actually, there's this video going around about a snowball fight, the guy who does, um, who did the John Wick movies. He made this really great video. It's, a, it's an iPhone commercial, but he made a great video showing a snowball fight in John Wick style action. Really, these things shoot unbelievable video. The failings, I think, in almost all, uh, any video coverage, I don't know about uh, with still photo, but is with uh, lighting and sound. So, and you're always going to need some kind of external microphone and you're always going to have to set up good lighting and the, the phones are not going to be able to solve that on their own. Maybe, maybe not. I, I, I imagine we're going to see phones start to push that. Uh, they, there's certain things they can do with microphones to, to bring far fields uh, stuff in, but more than that, Sound processing and lighting processing done by AI may be something. I, I agree with well, you that this, I don't think this, it'll ever quite reach what you do in real life, but they can start right. to to get close. Oh, no, and they're improving. And this is one of the things, like uh, one of the sensors on this is is about show doing sort of a, it does a flash thing to sense depth of field, so to create some kind of depth of field shot, which is what a mirrorless camera can do with the, you know the proper lens. Is it, you know you get a nice zoom in on your subject and you blur out the background, which create separation and everyone loves that shot. Yeah. Well, uh, Galaxy fans, uh, you're, you're getting an even better Galaxy phone, not with a huge battery to boot. I think that's the other thing that has people excited. Uh, less exciting, uh, but important, is Uber releasing a report listing all of the sexual assaults, homicides, and fatal accidents associated with its rides in the U.S. in 2017 and 2018. This is Uber trying to be transparent. Of the 2.3 billion rides... In that two-year period, the company says there were 19 fatal physical assaults, 5,951 sexual assaults, 45% of which, which were committed by the rider, not the driver, and 58 fatal crashes. So all in all, of the 2.3 billion rides, 0.0003% of rides ended in one of these three kinds of critical safety incident. The report is an effort to not only be transparent, but use the data to improve safety measures. And Uber announced it will start sharing the names of deactivated drivers with other ride hailing companies to make them aware of past incidents. And Uber is going to make uh, sexual assault and misconduct training mandatory for all U.S. drivers. Yeah, I think it uh when I when I first read these stats I was like, wow, I mean that physical assaults, you know, but it's this when you when you look at it in the in the sense of okay, 2.3 billion rides over a two year period total for the company, it's such a small number that kind of mimics unfortunately what human behavior sort of looks like anyway. It's it's it doesn't I mean, it's, cer it's certainly, you know, riders should be safe. Drivers should be safe. That hasn't always been the case. But I think that the company not only uh, being transparent about this is definitely a good thing. And also saying we're going to share this stuff with, with other companies and policies well, but, with other companies. So let me let me question that. But do you think that's a good thing? Because so Uber is coming out of like an, a massive amount of bad press, like a kind of an endless stream of bad press, if you will, which, by the way, I just want to mention I'm stunned like any business could survive the volume of bad press Uber got. So my question is, do you really think this is good? Because I don't know necessarily, because it's it's kind of, like you said initially, Sarah, kind of startling numbers and uncomfortable. Are people going to be happy about this information? I mean, well, I, I don't know yeah. if happy is I, the way I, I react about it. Yeah, I don't think anything about this is <laughs> like, oh, this is great news. But I think yeah. it's important news. And I think that if a driver yeah. is deactivated for something certainly involving a physical uh, altercation, whatever that may be, well, yeah, it is important for, you know, if that driver's just going to go to a competing uh, company and get behind the wheel again and there might be an ongoing problem. I mean, it's it's information that I think it's, it's better being shared than not shared. And oh. I do also think that the riders having a greater instance of assaulting the drivers is also really important because, you know, you get a lot of, a lot of people are taking Uber because they're drinking, you know, and they don't want to drive and you don't necessarily assault anybody because you're drinking, but you kind of see that stuff late at night a little bit more. And drivers, particularly women are really vulnerable in situations like that. So, you know, that's also a sobering statistic. 
I can't find an apples to apples comparison here, but the National Safety Council in the U.S. lists the 2017 rate of of traffic fatalities at 1.47 per 10,000 motor vehicles. Uh, so uh, I think that's the kind of thing you need to look at to make they sense need to of do this. A show comparison. Yeah, I yeah. would also know how they compare to the taxi industry for that matter. Certainly you know, on the sexual assault, I would like to see a comparison yeah. to the taxi industry because you don't hear about sexual assaults in the taxi industry, but that doesn't mean they don't happen. Right. And no, and also, I mean, and like you said at the beginning, Sarah, it's like, this is a good thing. And I'm kind of questioning, is it really, I mean, to reveal this information? And I'm saying it more, especially given what, you know, again, the massive amount of bad press that Uber's come on. I personally have, I go with a uh, competitor, a well-known competitor, mostly because my co-host used to work there too, as well. Uh, but the, uh, I, I'm just stunned that you know, they're, they're still so vibrant in business, given all their bad press. I, I'd be interested to know if this actually helps their street cred or in some ways sours it or kind of annoys all the other companies. I don't know. I have no idea. Yeah, I'm trying to find a good number, uh, but there are definitely uh, there are definitely a large number of sexual assaults. When I say large number, I mean in the thousands uh, that uh, that I'm seeing referenced in stories, but I can't find a a a serious uh, number on this. The Guardian UK said reports of sexual assaults by taxi drivers rose twenty percent in three years uh, in December of last year. Uh, so, or actually December of twenty seventeen. Um, so yeah, uh, good to have these numbers, but it's important to find other numbers that you can compare them to for context. Well, on a completely different and happier note, in November, the Crew Interactive Mobile Companion, or CMON, <laughs> have a lot of acronyms on the show this week, became the first autonomous free-floating robot and smart assistant to operate on the International Space Station. CMON 2 was launched Thursday on the SpaceX resupply mission. It has new features, including using the IBM Watts Watson Tone Analyzer to detect emotions, by crew, which would be tested as possible solution for groupthink, among other things. Simon can also look up information for astronauts conducting experiments and document activities with its video camera autonomously. Simon 2 will stay on the ISS for up to three years, and it's a collaboration between IBM, Airbus, and the German Aerospace Center. I'm going to call him Simon, because uh, that's just easier. And I think uh, <laughs> I think this is really cool. I, oh, wait, I really... Do we know what the official pronunciation of this thing is? No, I don't. Uh, I don't know. I'm going to call him Simon. Is what I'm saying. <laughs> I, uh, but but what, whatever you call him, he's uh, this is this is interesting, especially that you have a voice assistant when astronauts are working on experiments in tight quarters that they have to get right uh, in in a high stress environment. Let's face it, you're orbiting above the Earth. You got to pay attention. There's not a lot of room for mistakes, even though we've been doing it for a long time. Having the manual at hand where you can just say, okay, what's the next step in this experiment? I think that's that's super handy. Absolutely. I want to see a semen or a Simon semen. Oh, God, that didn't sound right, did it? That's, well, why, I I wanted, that. that's why I was trying to encourage us all to say Simon. But, you know, you well, you make listen, your own choices. I that's that's, that's up to you. Simon. Simon. I uh, wish we would have looked this up before the show. I'm embarrassed, and I apologize on behalf of the entire show. Well, on that note, uh, what's going on with uh, Rockets, Tom? It's uh, Project Simon. I just checked. I went to the... Uh, uh, an interview. So Rocket Lab completed mis mission running out of fingers, its 10th ever launch, which saw its two stage electron rocket carry an artificial meteor spacecraft and six microsatellites into orbit. Rocket Lab also tested a new guidance system for orienting the booster for reentry, gathering data to further its plans to eventually reuse the booster. And unlike SpaceX or Blue Origin, which vertically land the booster, Rocket Lab plans to use helicopters to capture its rather small 17 meter first stage booster during a controlled fall. It's just too small for them to reliably reland it the way SpaceX does. So they're going to send helicopters after it and try to catch it. Reuse uh, will help Electron reach its goal of one launch a week with 227 kilogram payloads. Loads. So I we're looking at. Yeah, go ahead, Sarah. I love the idea of a helicopter being like, get that, get that guy. <laughs> He's coming down, but not vertically. You know, let's catch him before he hits the ground. I don't know. The, so the, these, these are always uh, great visuals, but 
it's um it's pretty amazing that we're starting to get to the point um, with these various missions by private companies um, where uh, they're we're starting to think outside the box. Like, okay, so you got to get something up in the air. You got to launch some microsatellite into orbit. There's all sorts of or all sorts of ways to do that, um, but they all need rockets. And then we got to get these rockets back down. And how do we do that? So you know, good on Rocket Lab. Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, David, what do you think? Uh, th it's great to see more of these companies coming into the market and, well, this and is, providing this these was, Wasn't this the uh, old original SpaceX plan was, you know, see if you can r launch a rocket twice. And that was just such a, you know, an anomaly at the time that uh, who, who, could anyone actually do this? And now they're trying to normalize this behavior, which, you know, we have a history of this. And so, yeah, darn cool. I'm all for it. Yeah, it, it's good to see more of these kinds of companies. I think people hear about SpaceX all the time. They may hear about Blue Origin, but but not realize that there there are more of these kind of companies in the space uh, creating this sort of stuff. What if the helicopter doesn't catch the booster? It uh, probably won't be able to be reused. <laughs> right. You know, it, it seems like you kind of go like, "Well, that's cool." If it works, yeah. Well, and that that's why they're doing they they that's why they do these things in small steps, right? They they right. did try to catch this one. They used this to test the telemetry and find out what the data was, so that they have a good chance of catching it the first time. But yeah, SpaceX had a had a few fails on the relanding of theirs before they finally started to get it right. But that's how you get it right. Spotify announced its 2019 statistics, including the fact that Post Malone was the most streamed artist of the year, followed by Billie Eilish and Ariana Grande. But the surprising numbers actually came from Spotify podcasting. Spotify has more than 500,000 podcast titles in its catalog, and listeners to podcasts on Spotify have grown more than 50% over the year, along with a 39% rise in hours listened. Uh, comedy, society and culture, true crime, news and health and fitness were the top categories and the Joe Budden podcast with Rory and Maul, the top show. Yeah, this is uh, this is interesting because I was skeptical that Spotify was going to be able to make this work. Being a music company, I didn't know that they would understand what a podcast listener would want. Uh, and I've, you see companies do this all the time where they're like, oh, yeah, we'll get into this other business. And they don't do it well because they don't really understand how it works. But I feel like Spotify, maybe because of all the acquisitions they've made, bringing in people who do understand podcasting, uh, are really starting to do a really good job at creating a, a place where people find podcasts and want to listen to them. Do you know how many of your own listeners are Spotify consumers? No, I do, but I don't have the number off the top of my head. I think mine, it's like, it's about 10% for my podcast is Spotify that come through that. Mm -hmm. But I, I would have guessed that it would have been close to zero uh, when they first launched this because they had a gated community. They didn't have all the podcasts in. It was a music app. And well, they, you originally sort of... didn't let, they originally didn't let podcasters um, right. have their, like, it was, yeah, you know. It but was like then, an invite. Like, it was like a... I, I, I remember back in the day I had submitted a podcast and Spotify, you know, didn't accept me. I was, you know, I just submitted it and went, okay, well, that was the end of that. But that was that was some time ago. Um, it's obviously grown as a platform since then. And there are also exclusive podcasts on Spotify. And, and, and the company has made inroads in that sense and has uh, really popular podcasts that don't live anywhere else. And I think that that's, that's a big part of why it's seen good numbers. If yeah, they it's do that, um, yes, they will. They'll succeed. Yeah, it's a it's a smaller percentage than that uh, for for us. It's it's probably around three percent for us. It looks like I'm just looking at the numbers now, um, but I think it's probably going to grow. Honestly, I think I think Spotify has proven that they they've done what they need to do to actually make this work. Hey, By folks, the way, I, I wanted to say. Oh, that, sorry, Len. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Rob Walsh, who was one of the original podcasters, is behind, uh, I believe, Spotify, um, or trying to get at least on um, uh, trying to get more in Spotify's podcasting efforts. You mean? Uh, yeah, he's well for um, for. Is he uh, not with Libsyn anymore? No, he was with Libsyn, but he's really pushing the Spotify thing. So just wanted to say that. Well, because Libsyn, I know that they incorporated the Spotify statistics into their overall stats when they were actually split out. Now they're one in the same. And this literally just as of like a week or two ago. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, folks, if you want to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, uh, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com. All right. So 
We hear all the time, David, about companies who have had a breach, uh, had have lost data, uh, had an intruder steal their their information or their secrets. And I know I, I've seen it in the chat room over and over. People asking, why can't companies secure themselves better? You talk to CISOs, chief information security officers, all, all the, the time. time. In fact, you just had an hour long conversation about this topic. Uh, do you have any insights to help us understand what's going on there? Well, I, I can I can provide some information. I'm not going to say you know uh, I'll have the solution. Sadly, could you so please this solve is... this for all of us, David? <laughs> Thank you. Yes. So so. Just the term that is used in the industry is just, they call it the security basics or the security fundamentals. And it's like, you know, things like getting, you know, getting your patches down, having, you know, or having a patch management program specifically, um, getting firewalls set up, s configuring your cloud instances correctly. That is a common, common problem. Reason, you know, someone like, you know, got access to the cloud. Well, it wasn't quote a break in. It was just never configured properly in the first place. This an happened, AWS instance that was left unsecured. We hear about that all the time. Constantly, it's constant, and and also there are some that are just left open. They're just not used, forgotten about, and yet they're holding data. Or you have a third party that isn't secured as well as you're secured. I mean, so there's sort of a, it's a sprawling issue. Um, the the problem is that often it's hard to do a lot of these things at scale. Like for example, so often you'll hear a story of, you know, they were breached by a known vulnerability. That's a common, common term. Well, a company may have 3000 known vulnerabilities that they need to patch. They can't do it. So what they do is they have a patch management program where they have to prioritize things and things could take, you know, 90 days, if not longer to patch or sometimes never for that matter. Um, but I will say this, this issue comes up all the time on our shows. And specifically, they talk about getting the basics down, getting your security basics down. And I'll tell you, one of the other basics down is communicating to the rest of the staff about the importance of security, about maintaining your own personal security and the company's security. And usually they sort of, and that's why like most companies have to go through security awareness training, which is much maligned and not appreciated. So. Now CISOs are trying to figure out more ways to make this more entertaining and engaging and people see the value of it. So it doesn't become more of a, um, a requirement rather than, oh, I see the value of it. So it's not something people try to avoid because it's tedious. You, you want people to understand that it's an important thing to do. Yeah, well, for a lot of people, it currently is tedious. I mean, we, we did a show once and we asked the audience, because I do a lot of these live recordings, and we asked the audience how many people have gone through security awareness training. And like this, like this audible groan through the whole room was heard. So it's it's pretty clear it's not an enjoyed. By well, because even if someone goes through the training, it doesn't mean that they pay attention and absorb it the way that it is intended right. if they're bored. And also, everyone's like, "How the hell do I get out of this? I got more yeah. important things to do." Yes. So the more, it's about micro advice, like uh, and tips. I know we had uh, this. Uh, we had this woman uh, from uh, Facebook who uh, does security for their new um, uh, cryptocurrency that's coming out. And she, they do something during, well, during the security awareness of October, which is uh, security awareness month um, called Hacktober, where they have a whole slew of different games that they play with people and they give away exclusive Facebook swag to Facebook employees if they achieve certain goals. So gamifying turns out to be one of the more popular ways to create security awareness and get down to basics and deal with these problems. But yes, the volume of breaches is high. I would say my number one tip for everybody, start using a password manager if you are not already and employ two-factor or multi-factor authentication wherever you can. Those two things will help you dramatically. I think scale is really important going back to that yes. point because when you sitting at home or me sitting here uh, hear about an unpatched vulnerability leading, uh, it's, it's perfectly natural to say, well, why didn't they patch it? I patched my stuff. I got my Android update this this week and I press OK. Uh, it's <laughs> not that simple for a company no. with thousands of employees with, as you said, thousands of vulnerabilities to patch to just say, oh, let me press OK, patch all my software. It's, it, it doesn't work that way. 
No, and there, and I will tell you that there are companies out there. You know, what one of a sponsor of our show, a company called Vulcan uh, Cyber, that is trying to sort of deal with this patch management issue. Because, and I will tell you also, that, you, know, you know, another company that we has sponsored us, Exonius, has also dealt with asset management. Just knowing what the heck you've got uh, in your environment, you know, these these really basic needs that companies have, like how do I know what I have, uh, how do I patch management. These are kind of becoming the new darlings in the security industry because they've been sort of dazzled by who's got the latest AI and machine learning and blo you know blockchain empowered solution. When the reality is, I need to deal with some very basic fundamental issues before I look at what's glitzing. It's funny the 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 problems here are very similar to the problems that people have in general with social networks and moderation and toxicity and et cetera. Is the problem is bigger than humans can manage uh, because we we had such an efficient way of doing one thing, but we don't have an efficient way of keeping up with it. So we have an efficient way of pushing information out on social networks, but we right. don't have an efficient way of moderating that. And same with vulnerabilities. We have an efficient way of installing and rolling out software, uh, but we don't have such an efficient way of of being able to keep it secure. Yeah, I mean that's it, that is really it in a nutshell. And it, honestly, pr, you know, pre-cloud, post-cloud, that's kind of your dividing point of when things started exploded. And then as the usage of cloud just dramatically mm -hmm. increases, it, it just becomes a more and more complicated issue for that matter. Yeah. So I mean, yes, uh, as uh, uh, Bart Bouchot says on uh, the Security Bits portion of the Silicast podcast, stay patched so you stay secure. That's very good advice for the individual and not impossible to accomplish. It's it's a harder challenge uh, for it, large enterprises. Not trying to let them off the hook, but I'm saying it's not the it's not an equivalent situation. It is, and also even if all your patches are good, like the number one way people get into companies and they they essentially violate a company is getting uh, getting valid credentials. Right. So there's this other you Fishing know. Somebody. Yeah. 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 And you have thousands of, of of employees. It's again, it's a scale problem. It's harder to keep them, right? Yeah. And so the people who really need to be trained are the executives. The executives need to be trained as much as possible on the importance of this. Bingo. Train the executives. Thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit, train the executives. Submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com and also join in on the conversation in our Discord. It's a lot of fun. You can join by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. Hey, Sarah, what's in the mailbag? Oh, Tom, I'm glad you asked. Uh, so we had that story about a possibly wireless iPhone coming in 2021. We got several emails. Alex and Christopher both uh, were, were of those emails saying, here's the problem with that, CarPlay. Everything's got to change. Got to plug in your phone for CarPlay. This isn't going to work for me. Uh, well, Marcus, who says he's from, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, Minnesota, Aww. had a few thoughts I know, regarding the rumored port-free iPhone in 2021. Marcus says, it's clear that Apple's headed this way. I'll be on board if they include this one feature, a magnetic smart connector like on the iPads. To Patrick's point, Patrick Beja yesterday, this could enable a cable-like experience for those times when you need to plug in via CarPlay or do data transfer or charge via a wall outlet. You could just use a new cable with a magnetic smart connector on the end, and it could work much like the old MagSafe or the newer iPad smart connector. Apple's expertise with magnets is on full display in the iPad Pro. This would be a logical next implementation, and it would be very Apple. Remove a major port, but try to replace it with something better. I would love if they would uh, standardize this across iPhone, iMac, and Mac lineup so they could bring back MagSafe, uh, that iPhone, iPad, and Mac lineup, rather, so they could bring back MagSafe while still removing the port from the phone. I love this email from Marcus because he didn't just notice a problem, but he went ahead and thought through, like, well, here's how they might react. Uh, and and then and then evaluated that part of it. Very very forward thinking. Thanks, Marcus. Uh, and thanks to everybody who wrote in with their thoughts on this. Uh, you know, sometimes you know it's, it's uh, something something sparks something. We got a lot of lot of feedback on that particular idea. And again, we don't know if that's happening yet. But we do know that we're shouting out our patrons at our master and grandmaster levels, including Michael Akins, Chris Allen, and Agracia A. Daniels. 
Let's check in with Len Peralta, who has been illustrating today's show. Len, what do you have for us? Yeah, you know, uh, I uh, was pretty excited about this whole Spotify stats thing, and uh, especially about the podcasting uh, part of it, only because, you know, I've been podcasting, and you and I, Tom, have been podcasting for a real long time, so it's finally good that it's hitting the mainstream. But I feel like uh, there's some people who maybe are wannabes. They want to be doing a podcast, and so this is kind of what that's about. Uh, it, this is called wannabe, and uh, the the <laughs> stat here is that some people, when this particular person who looks a little bit like me spent fifty five thousand two two hundred seventy eight minutes thinking about finally starting a popular podcast this year. Uh, you had no original ideas, but did manage to think about Ariana Grande's video Focus 2,630 <laughs> times while waiting to order your 83rd roast beef sandwich from Arby's. So, ah, so uh, it's an infographic. It is. It's just it's a little stat that maybe you may have missed if you weren't paying close attention to all the stats from Spotify. So, um, so yeah, so this is available right now on my uh, on my online store. Also, if you're a Patreon backer, you can get it right now at patreon.com forward slash Len. And I just want to rem remind people with the holidays coming up, uh, I have pretty much an open queue for my cr custom drawn cr uh, Christmas cards, holiday cards. Oh, wow. Uh, so go over there and order right now. This is the best time to do it. So. If you don't have an idea for a Christmas card, take advantage of that open slot while it's still there. Yes, please do. Thank you, Len. And also thanks to David Spark for being with us today. David, how do people keep up with your work, your podcast, and everything that you do? Just go to CISOseries.com. Again, CISO stands for Chief Information Security Officer. And we have two podcasts. And if you're in the cybersecurity field or you want to learn more about it, or specifically if you sell it in the cybersecurity field, we have one show called the CISO Security Vendor Relationship Podcast. And that talks about that. And then we also have another show called Defense in Depth, which uh, we pick one hot topic and we go into depth. And my co-host, Mike Johnson, who's now the CISO of Fastly, formerly the CISO of Lyft, and my other co-host, who's uh, Alan Alford, the former CISO of Mitel, now uh, delivery CISO at NTT, uh, they are my co-hosts and they are the wisdom. I just keep the, keep the balls up in the air. So give the shows a listen. They're a lot of fun. Excellent. Go do that, folks. Check them out, CISOseries.com. Uh, and don't forget, we have new patron reward merchandise uh, to celebrate six years of DTNS. Len created us a six-year anniversary DTNS logo. I just shared it in the uh, Discord today. And if you back certain levels at patreon.com slash DTNS for three months, you'll get either a sticker, a poster, a mug, or a T-shirt with that logo on it. Depends on what level you back, what you get. You can find out all the details at patreon.com slash DTNS slash merch. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We are also live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 21.30 UTC. And you can find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. See you Monday. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> project manager for Project Simon.